Dara O'Brien. Gamaleshke. No, no, no. Gamaleshke. And Dara Ella. And Dara Ella. Gurmagad, Gurmagad, and Dara is tough. Gurmagad, Kian Kola. Tanishte, looking at the papers here and in the UK, I think you'll agree there's a huge contrast on how the draft withdrawal agreement is actually being received. It's a 585 page long document and it outlines in detail how 45 years of deep integration, protecting certain rights, defining outstanding obligations and actually sets out a transition period in which both the EU and the UK can adjust. Commitments in this document go up to 2030 and beyond. It sets out how EU citizens who live in the UK will be catered for in relation to their rights and indeed how UK citizens will be catered for within the EU. One of the protocols in the draft agreement makes unique arrangements for the North of Ireland. This includes protection of rights, security cooperation and the continuation of the common travel area. In this draft withdrawal agreement, the Good Friday Agreement remains intact. This protocol also outlines how the backstop arrangements, sorry, excuse me, the backstop arrangements and how, that, how these would remain in place unless a separate EU-UK deal actually replaces them. This draft agreement allows the UK to leave the EU on the 29th of March next, which is only in 165 days' time. It is a draft treaty until the EU on November the 26th meet and more importantly until the UK Parliament vote on it before Christmas. Our party, as you know, Tanishta, gave a cautious welcome to the draft withdrawal agreement that has taken thousands of hours of negotiation, meeting and compromises from all sides. It is obviously in Ireland and the UK and indeed the EU's interest to have a Brexit deal. The alternative does not bear thinking about because it will have huge economic and other ramifications for Ireland and the, and the UK and indeed the EU as a whole. However, the alternative no deal crash out may become a reality and we will have to plan accordingly given what is happening this morning and continues to happen in Britain as I stand here today. The DUP have unfortunately said that they will not be voting for the agreement even before they read it. The Brexit Secretary Dominic Raab has resigned his post and two other junior ministers have also resigned so far. Three now, it shows you how quickly things are moving. We do not know if there will be any more as the day goes on and while it's a matter for the UK it does have serious consequences for Ireland and the rest of the EU. Tanisha, do you accept that these resignations are giving very negative in indications for the ability of the UK Parliament to vote for the draft withdrawal agreement, particularly as the British Labour Party leader Jeremy Corbyn in the UK said this morning that the draft deal, and I quote him, is ill-defined and that he would prefer no deal rather than a bad deal. Have you, Tony or the Taoiseach, met or are you planning to meet with Mr Corbyn to discuss the draft withdrawal agreement before the vote takes place? And as the EU Council is meeting on Sunday week next, on the 26th of November, do you, Tanisha, expect changes to the current draft after that Council meeting? Thank and you can you confirm, finally, that Government are increasing your preparedness for a no-deal Brexit scenario as advised by the European Commission? Uh, thank you, Deputy. And, um, can I thank all parties in this House <coughs> for their... Uh, for their cautious welcome of the, uh, the text, uh, the draft text of a withdrawal treaty that was uh, supported last night by the British Cabinet uh, and that we expect will be supported also by the European Council. Um, this has been a long and at times a very difficult negotiation and I want to pay tribute to the Irish teams of negotiators uh, and diplomats in particular uh, who have done an extraordinary job uh, to build and maintain EU unity uh, around many of the Irish vulnerabilities and questions. Uh, I also want to thank Michel Barnier uh, for, for his extraordinary capacity to understand the detail uh, of uh, the multiple uh, concerns and questions that have come from this island uh, in the context of Brexit and its potential fallout, uh, and for accommodating uh, all of the commitments 
that have been made to Ireland and to the EU by the British Prime Minister and her government during these negotiations to date in the legal text that was delivered last night. Uh, there were many commitments made uh, in a um, political statement last December. Those commitments were added to again in March, uh, and I think many people were sceptical uh, as to whether they could be translated into a legal text uh, that could be sold in both sides of the Irish Sea uh, in a way that protects this island, uh, the relations on it, north and south, in a way that does not in any way undermine the uh, constitutional integrity of the United Kingdom, including Northern Ireland, but in the same way provides pragmatic solutions that can ensure that we do not face the prospect uh, of physical border infrastructure or related checks or controls between the two jurisdictions on this island. Uh, and I think that is what this agreement does. Uh, it involves compromise, it involves flexibility on both sides, it, it, it has involved a response from the EU side to the British Prime Minister's demands uh, that Northern Ireland couldn't be separated from uh, the rest of the United Kingdom in the context of a customs territory uh, and that issue uh, has been resolved. Uh, so what we have is a deal and a text that follows through in the commitments that have been made uh, and, uh, and uh, does so in a way that protects Ireland's core interests now and into the future uh, in a way that we can all stand over, I hope. Of course there are challenges to selling any package in the United Kingdom and in Westminster. Uh, many people would say that there isn't a majority for any way forward in the House of Commons. Uh, and so uh, the British Prime Minister has said last night that she faces difficult days ahead. And I'm sure she does. Uh, but she is resilient. Uh, she has shown a, a remarkable capacity to get things done in very difficult circumstances. Uh, and certainly we want to work with her and support her in the context of the, of the future relationship negotiations that need to happen you, to ensure that the backstop that is now catered for in this agreement never gets used. Uh, and I hope we will have the opportunity to do that. Thank you, Tanish. Deputy O'Brien. Uh, uh, Tanish, I did ask whether you had any plans, whether you had met the British uh, Labour leader, Jeremy <coughs> Corbyn, or whether you planned to do so. So you might answer that question when you come back in. Look, we all acknowledge that there are deep and serious concerns within the UK. And I would say, Tarnish, that, that there's, there's no triumph in negotiating something which can't be delivered. So we all need to be mature about this. And I would say further that the time for victory and celebration is when this draft agreement is accepted and ratified by all. I think you and your, your ministers should be acutely aware of the impact of comments made here in Ireland on, during a very sensitive and volatile situation in the UK. And I would ask, Tanishta, that you, your colleagues in government, to try from today to resist the temptation to brief uh, in victor vitriolic statements to the press, as we have seen in some of the Irish newspapers today. I think that's irresponsible, and I think you should desist from doing that. You put the national interest first in this instance. So a, lot of, a lot of time and effort has gone in by your government and indeed with the support of the opposition. So I think every statement being made in Ireland here is being scrutinised and we should be aware of that. Silence from government you, worked on Monday and Tuesday. And I would ask you to go back and be silent maybe for the next day or two and to let the process move through, uh, move through Westminster. We have to be uh, conscious of that. I would ask though that in relation to contingency planning, and I heard Minister Donoghue this morning I'm saying that a lot of very please. detailed work has happened. Will you now publish the sectoral contingency plans on the basis uh, of a no-deal scenario and actually let the sector see what, what level of preparedness we actually are at at this moment in time in Thank Ireland? Deputy. Yeah, well, Deputy, first of all, uh, can I say that we speak to all political parties across the United Kingdom all the time. Uh, you know, I've got to know Ker Starmer well, who's the, um, uh, the Labour spokesperson uh, on Brexit. He's a very fine person uh, uh, and is uh, on top of the detail. Um, uh, and we will continue to have conversations, of course, uh, with all political parties. But I think our, the Irish government needs to be careful uh, not to be pretending that we can influence British politics and not to try to do so publicly either, uh, because we might well find that, uh, that it will have the opposite effect. Um, uh, there is a British uh, political system that needs to tease through the detail 
of this text. Uh, that will happen in, in the coming days and weeks and there will be a vote at the end of that. Uh, we will have a detailed debate here too. Uh, and I can assure you that neither the Taoiseach or I or Minister McEntee or, or any other ministers for that matter uh, are going to be claiming victories or anything like that. Uh, that has not been happening. Yesterday we were very careful not to comment uh, when it wasn't helpful to do so. But we do have an obligation. We do have an obligation to explain to the Irish people what has been agreed. Uh, and we have an obligation to both explain that and to reassure people that it deals with core Irish concerns. Because there are many people out there uh, who are very sceptical that it was possible to get this deal done. Uh, and it is, it, it, is, it is the role of government to be able to explain to Thank people you, in appropriate language uh, why this deal is no threat to nationalism or unionism in Northern Ireland, why it's no threat to the, to the uh, sovereign integrity of the United Kingdom, uh, but instead this is a practical compromise by all sides to allow for a managed, sensible Brexit to move forward in a way that protects core Irish interests and ensures that we are not the collateral damage uh, from an unmanaged uh, uh, or um, a Brexit deal uh, that doesn't I'm take into account the interests of Britain's neighbours as well as Britain itself. Deputy Pierce Doherty. Uh, since the Brexit referendum result became clear, Sinn Féin have been unequivocal in stating that Brexit presents the most serious social, economic and political threat uh, to our island in a, in a generation. We have been crystal clear in stating that your government's approach to the negotiations had to be uh, guided by the appreciation that the majority of people in the North voted to remain and that view must be recognised and that view needs to be respected. And we put the case for special status that takes cognizance of the unique circumstances uh, that present themselves on our island. And that means, as we have well rehearsed, means no return to a hard border, that citizens' rights are protected, that the Good Friday Agreement and all its parts are protected and upheld. And yesterday's deal is not perfect. Uh, it's not even a good one if one accepts that Brexit, in whatever guise, uh, is bad. It's bad for everyone, it's bad for Ireland, it's bad for Britain, and it's bad for the European Union, and we accept that. There is no such thing as a good Brexit. Brexit is bad for our island, whatever the circumstances or whatever the deal that's on the table. Having said that, but I want to acknowledge that the deal agreed and approved by the British Cabinet yesterday is one that mitigates against the worst as aspects of Brexit. There are other issues that we need to iron out in the time ahead, things that need to be clarified, and some of those can be addressed by your government, by the House of the Rockers, uh, particularly in relation to the issue of rights and the issue of representation, and we will return to those in due course. I believe some of those concerns were raised with you this morning uh, by my party Vice President Michelle O'Neill as part of a delegation of parties presenting the pro-Remain majority in the North. And I don't want to labour this point, Tanisha, but it's worth saying that the four parties that you and the Tisha met this morning represent the majority view of citizens in the North. The DUP do not. DUP representatives have been over the last 48 hours using the most incendiary, brash and ostentatious rhetoric, and it's not helpful. It is absolutely reckless and it's irresponsible. Ordinary citizens in the North, whether they be Republicans, Nationalists, Unionists or otherwise, recognise that Brexit is not good and they want a deal that protects their livelihoods and their futures. And let's say this again, this is not an orange or a green issue. When we speak, we speak for the majority on a cross-community basis, yeah. not narrow, ill-founded interests. We made that point to the British Prime Minister last night during the course of a phone call with her. And during the course of that conversation, Tanisha, she said that the advice of the British Attorney General in respect of the withdrawal agreement would be made uh, available to those in the House of Commons before the so-called meaningful vote. You too, Tanisha, presumably will have access to advice in relation to the Irish Protocol, whether from our own Attorney General or in relation to the European Commission. And I want to know if you will publish that or a summary of such what would be appropriate to publish so that we in this House can have the fullest possible picture and the legal certainty of what is on the table uh, prior to any vote. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Deputy, Deputy um, I want to remind the House, as, uh, as you have, that Brexit is not Ireland's policy. Uh, we don't agree with it. We think it's a mistake. Uh, but at the same time, we have to respect the decision of the United Kingdom as a whole 
who have voted to leave the European Union. Uh, but we also have an obligation to ensure uh, that because Ireland is uniquely exposed and vulnerable to the fallout of Brexit, uh, that we have been and continue to be very much part of these negotiations to ensure that we are protecting the core interests of Irish people, north and south, and indeed many British people uh, living on this island, uh, who may be negatively impacted by unintended consequences from the fallout of Brexit. Consequences that were not discussed during the Brexit referendum, for the most part. The complexity of which was not understood when many people voted to leave the European Union, but perhaps understand it now. Uh, and what the Prime Minister has had to do, and what we have had to do, and what Michel Barnier and his team have had to do, is to deal with the complexity of that to ensure that we turn uh, a decision by a majority in the United Kingdom to leave the European Union into a practical set of legal commitments in a treaty that can organise and manage that to limit the fallout, uh, to protect vulnerable communities and people, to ensure that we have the closest possible future relationship between the United Kingdom and the EU in the future, to allow for trade and political cooperation and so much more besides. And that's what the last 12 months of intensive negotiation in relation to getting the text of this treaty that was signed off on last night uh, agreed has been about. Uh, and I hope it's not going to be about a majority versus a minority in Northern Ireland trying to win the argument against each other in the weeks ahead. We need to ensure that minorities as well as majorities in Northern Ireland are reassured that any wording of a legal treaty related to Brexit isn't a threat to them and that we can try and protect where possible the status quo on this island where neighbours and people with very different backgrounds and very different um, uh, uh, ideas and dreams for the future of their country can actually live together understanding that we are protecting core interests of everybody which is what we're trying to do here and so for anyone to take absolutist positions uh, has been and continues to be unhelpful in terms of trying to find a way forward. Um, but there are certain things that everybody, I think, wants out of this treaty. One is no return to, to a physical hard border on this island. Nobody wants it. And we have now guarantees that prevent that. We want to ensure that the common travel area between Britain and Ireland remains intact. And that's here and catered for. We wanted to make sure that the, uh, the land bridge that is Britain to allow Ireland to get goods to and from this island can continue to be used efficiently to do that. And again, strong language and wording in regard to this, uh, to this text. In relation to the Good Friday Agreement itself, 20 years old this year, the foundation for allowing people to live in the absence of violence by and large, uh, which wasn't possible before that, that that gets protected in all of its parts. Thank you, Thomas. And that is in Britain's interests as well as Ireland's interests. And that is why uh, the Prime Minister, to her credit, has faced people down when necessary uh, to ensure that the importance of the Good Friday Agreement to the United Kingdom and to Ireland uh, is factored in in the context of these negotiations. Thank you, Tanisha. Deputy Doherty. Tanisha, and I think anybody reading uh, the document, if they take the time to read the document, will, will, will hear very clearly and see very clearly in the text that there should be no threat uh, or perceived threat. Uh, real or otherwise in relation to the unionist community in, in the north. The issue of interpretation of this text is, is going to be crucial. Uh, and the question I put to you uh, was following from the conversation with Theresa May uh, and her uh, agreement to publish the legal uh, documents uh, in terms of the withdrawal agreement prior to a vote in the House of Commons, uh, whether the Irish Government thinks that is an appropriate thing to do here. Uh, I listened to the comments by Theresa May uh, as she addressed the House of Commons just before I entered, enter, uh, entered this chamber, uh, and she was addressing the issue of uh, the Irish Protocol, uh, and she said very clearly that it is not legally acceptable under Article 50 to establish a permanent set of permanent relationships in the withdrawal agreement, uh, and, and that kind of calls into question the permanency of all of this. Um, and I understand that Theresa May has to do what Theresa May has to do, and she has a difficult task in the, in the time ahead. We also need to do what we need to do, and we know that Brexit isn't something that is fleeting. We know that it is here. We know that it is real. We know, and we share in this House, Thank we you, understand Deputy. the impact that Brexit can have. So I think it is important in relation to the Irish Protocol that the legal advice in relation to the permanency 
and the certainty in relation to that would be provided to this House in whatever form is suitable. And I think that that should be taken into consideration by yourself, Minister, and by the Cabinet, and should happen before a a vote in this House. I mean, just on on the the permanence or otherwise of of a backstop that is there as a fallback position, if, if nothing else can be agreed to resolve the border issue through a future relationship uh, agreement uh, during uh, a transition period or an extended transition period. Uh, and what it said is that the objective of the withdrawal agreement is not to establish a permanent relationship between the Union and the United Kingdom, uh, but it also says that the provisions of this protocol shall apply unless and until they are superseded in whole or in part by a subsequent agreement. So in other words, the definition of temporary is unless and until something else can be agreed. And the key issue there uh, is that, first of all, nobody wants to use the backstop. So it only gets triggered if it has to be used uh, in the absence of anything else that can do the same job. And even if it is triggered, there are review mechanisms which, which clearly suggest that the intention here is that this is temporary until we can put another agreement in place that everybody can sign up to. But of course, that other agreement to solve the problem has to be agreed by both sides. And that language is very clear in this too, to reassure people. So yes, if a backstop is used, and I hope it won't be, uh, I certainly hope it will be temporary until we can get a comprehensive enough future relationship agreement which will be permanent that fundamentally solves the border question, which is what we're all trying to do. Uh, And we will work with the British Prime Minister on that. On legal advice, and I think this is important, this is an agreement and a text that has been agreed between the EU collectively and the UK as a British, uh, uh, through the British government. And so the legal advice in relation to this text from an Irish perspective is EU legal advice. Uh, and, you know, the Irish AG may well have his, right, thank his, you, his view on it, but, but the actual legal advice uh, from an Irish perspective here comes from the pretty extensive legal team that is available to, uh, to Michel Barnier and his task force. Thank you very much.